Thank you guys. Hello, thank you for being here. So we have excitement in the house, I like it. Um, welcome to Stories on Stage Sacramento for our 2024 season. This is our first event of the season. Um, I'm Jessica Lasky, the Executive Director. Um, so we're very happy to have you here. Um, it's a good crowd, we're very excited. Um, I'm just gonna go through some sort of basic information, the sort of run of things, the run order, just so you're aware of what's happening when. Um, and then we'll start the show. Um, so just so you guys are aware, for this season, we have four events. This is the first of four. Um, we have, they're all on second Fridays of the month. So the next ones are in May, August, and November. And if you're on the newsletter, you've probably already been bombarded with that little calendar saying like, you're our next event. So if you would like to be on the newsletter, um, you can go to our website and click sign up um, so that you can get, we do not send very many. It's essentially just, here's the next one, please come. And that's it. <laughs> um, there's also a program that is fully digital so we don't kill as many trees. Um, and it's on the back table where you came in for tickets. There's a little QR code on a couple of signs. So if at intermission you'd like to make sure to snap that and it's information about the authors, information about the actors, and then the order of things. Um, but I'm gonna tell you that right now. Um, so just also um, at intermission, um, after, right after intermission, we're gonna have our raffle, which we do every time. So you should have gotten a little yellow ticket when you came in. Um, so make sure you hang on to that because that's how we will determine who the winner is. There will be three books um, on offer for the raffle in a cute little tote bag for Stories on Stage. Um, <laughs> let's see, what else? Um, actually, basic things. Please turn off your cell phone. Silence. Whatever you do to make it not dingle. <laughs> um, the exits. Uh, right back out that same door you came, but in the event of a giant emergency, you can run out these doors and it goes straight to the parking lot. We hope that doesn't happen, but those are exits. Uh, the bathrooms, you've probably already discovered. There are two right in the back of the theater on either side. Uh, we also, on the back tables, this is for intermissions, you're aware, we have things for sale. Josh Fernandez has his books for sale. Frank Joya has his books for sale. We also have stories on stage totes and our 2020 anthology that are for sale. Um, the cookies are complimentary from Sue Stats. Um, obviously we have a tip jar, but she makes those with the love in her heart every single time, which we very much appreciate. Um, I also would like to thank our other volunteers who are here every single time to make sure things run well. Uh, Anna and Joella here every time. Sue also volunteers her time. Kelly, our videographer. Yeah, we could not do this without them. So we very much appreciate them. Uh, let's see, what else? Now I'll just tell you the run order of things. Uh, the first act will have two of the shorter pieces, and then the second act will have the longer excerpt from uh, the memoir. So the first act is going to be the story Craps by Frank Joya, read by Jacob Gutierrez Montoya, and then Triple by Philip Jacques, also read by Jacob Gutierrez Montoya. I'll tell you about the next one once we come back from intermission. There will be a 15 minute intermission after um, the first two pieces are read and right after the pieces are read, something we tried out at the very end of last season, we're gonna be doing 20 questions with the authors. Um, so the first one will obviously be with Frank and Philip. The first part of the um, program, we'll do 20 questions with them. And then after the second act, we will do the same with Josh. I think that's all I have to say. So, without further ado, I would love to welcome Jacob to the stage. Thank you. All right, you guys, I'm going to be re uh, reading Craps by Frank Joya. Uh, this story was first published by the Troy Bookmakers in 2021 and re reissued by uh, Bordigera Press. Is that how to say that? Bordigera? I think yes. so, Frank. Wonderful, yes. yay. <laughs> Bordigera Press in 2023 as part of the Mercury Man Remembering Brooklyn, a memoir, a collection of short stories. <clears throat> he threw down a few crumpled bills, bill, ah, sorry, he threw down a few crumpled bills near the brick wall. Someone standing in the crowd said, you're covered, man, go ahead, roll them. The shooter blew into his fist, shook his right hand, closed his eyes and said to himself, as if in prayer, help me, Jesus. Bless me, Mary and Joseph. Show me a seven, baby. Show me a seven. And the other guy said, throw the fucking bones already, will ya? <laughs> snake eyes, baby, snake eyes. 
I listened as the sound from the dice game drifted over the wooden benches. The lingo of craps was familiar to me. I had watched Lefty and his friends play outside Sal's pool hall on Madison. You only needed a wall, a garage door, and a few guys feeling lucky with a little money in their pockets. I hadn't played before, not for real money. This was for dollars, not some loose change. Up until then, my experience with dice had been playing Monopoly, but I was itching to give it a try. The worst I could do was lose a few bucks. You had to know when to lay down the money and when not to. That's strategic. It was about the shooter. He controlled the dice and the betting. Sure, luck was a part of it, but skill entered in too. Was the shooter hot or cold? What point did you need a hit to win? You had a better chance of throwing a six or an eight than the odds of hitting an outside number, like a four or five, or a nine and a 10. We were hanging outside the garages, near the pool room, <coughs> around the corner from Jimmy's apartment on Central. It was where he kept that 56 Lincoln, shiny black with the suicide doors. Mm. I was hanging back, watching the action. The shooter was hot. I'd thrown a natural on the doors. I was uh, uh, on the doors of the two of the first three rolls. He had hit a tough point, little Joe, a four in between. Throw a seven or an 11, a natural on the initial roll, and you're a winner. Throw a seven after the point has been established, and you lose. The point is the number you have to match. If you don't throw a natural on the first roll. Now the shooter had a fistful of dollars in his left hand and the cubes in his right. He laid down a 10 spot and a couple of guys took five to cover. Little Louie bet a pound on a fade and started yelling, come on mama boxcars, craps for daddy. <laughs> the fade is a side bet, <laughs> either for or against the shooter. The guy said 7-11 baby, 7-11 and let the dice fly. Boxcars, motherfucker, boxcars! The sound of the players was all you needed to know. The shooter started cursing because he had let the winning bets ride. Played double or nothing. So when he rolled craps, he lost everything. Craps is either a two, snake eyes, a three, a twelve, boxcars on the first roll. Throw any of those before the point is set and you lose. Throw it after and it doesn't mean shit. One of the older guys said, who's up? If I wanted in, it was my roll. I picked up the dice and I felt my belly tighten. I threw down a deuce and somebody snickered and said, I've got the heavy hitter. You're covered, big guy. Roll him. I shook my right hand and I heard myself say, let her rip. Come on, seven. I let him fly. They came up 11 and I was up two bucks. Let it ride. I said I could feel myself start to relax. The shooter controls the ivories for as long as he keeps winning. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. I shouted and I won again. <laughs> Fuck this shit, first natural, now the devil. The guy who covered my bet said, the tone, of his voice, the, the tone of his voice betraying how pissed off he was, now I'm up six bucks. And I didn't know what the bones could still give me. So I said, take it down. And I picked up the, the eight bucks laying on the ground and I rolled the dice a few threw craps. A three, and Louis started yelling, AC Doocy, mama, AC Doocy, my roll. Jimmy shouted down from the kitchen window. Hey, Frankie, wanna go for a ride? Sure, I said. I'm up a deuce, man. I'll buy you an ice cream. <laughs> the end. <laughs> That's a lot of fun to read. <laughs> Um, all right, moving on. <laughs> Triple by Philip Jacques. This story won first place in the Gold Country Writer Short Story Contest in 2023 and was subsequently published by the Auburn Journal. <clears throat> this is a fun, this is fun fact. <laughs> Take your base, the umpire yells, motioning the batter to first on the called ball four. Runners advance, loading the bases, no outs. Damn, slapping my glove against my knee. I approach the mound to talk to Russ. Kevin jogs up from home plate, all chest protector, face masks, slap, slap, slap in shin guards. Three 11 year old boys huddled up. The weight of the world is upon us. What's the problem? Kevin smacks the ball into Russ's glove. Don't know, Russ mumbles. I can't seem to find the zone, you know? 
Yeah, 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 Kevin responds. But you've got to, Russ. This is the last inning, and we only lead by one. That ain't much, Russ. I put my shoulder on his, put my hand on his shoulder. You gotta get in control of yourself and pitch, damn it. The next batter is Biff the Bomber. Kevin's hot. He has his twisted face nose to nose with Russ. He kills it every time, Russ. Throw it down and outside. <sighs> Kevin turns in a huff to home plate, taking a few steps before looking over his shoulder at Russ. Don't miss. A fastball down and outside to a right-handed batter means a one-hopper straight to me, the shortstop. I, I jog back, stopping at my usual spot, but thinking of the pitch, I move close to the infield line. I'd better be ready. Kevin signals the outfield to a line left, where we believe a big hit's gonna go. But with the bases loaded, I signal the infield, infield to stay put, which means Toby's usual setup, at first leading off toward second, and Davey at second toward first. I have the gap between third and second, while Vince covers the runner tight at third. He's the only runner that matters right now. We cannot let him score. Bat in hand, Biff stands in the batter box. He sweeps the plate clean with his shoe, then sets his cleats firmly into the orange sand. He wraps both hands around the throat of his bat and swings a slow motion warm up, showing Russ where he wants to pitch, belt high in center. Like everyone here, he knows Russ is struggling. Now's his chance to take it all. A single brings the runner on third home and ties the game. A double brings the runner on second also home and wins it. And a home run shames us forever. <laughs> <laughs> Biff gives Russ a shit-eating grin. Wide as a manhole cover and waits. <laughs> I lean into my bent at the knee, bent at the waist, bent at the knees position. I adjust my blue cap against the noonday sun. I slap my glove with my right hand and chant, Hey, bada bada! Hey, bada bada! The infield and the outfield join in. Hey, bada bada! Over and over to distract the fearsome Biff. He couldn't care less. He raises his, ding his dingy up Louisville slugger and stares right through Russ. Russ takes the sign from Kevin, but rejects it, shaking his head no. Ah, oh, jeez, I mutter. Kevin shoots me a glance and rolls his eyes. A curveball. He gives Russ the sign, two fingers tapping his right inside thigh. Russ shakes it off. Damn it, Russ. Kicking the field with my toe. Quit screwing around. Russ takes the third. Russ takes the third sign and darts his eyes at me. Then his right knee. It's the low outside fastball Kevin called for the first time. I slap my glove. I crouch. I screw my eyes into the bat poised above Biff's shoulder. And I'm ready. But Biff raises his head, his hand. Calling for a timeout. <laughs> he takes two steps off the batter box, hikes up his pants, Biff spits, he smiles, <laughs> and Biff rubs his hands and picks up his bat and steps back in. He's toying with Russ, and everybody could see it. <laughs> Kevin calls for the same curveball as the first, and this time, Russ agrees. Hey, batter, 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 the infield sings. Russ stands straight, eases his hands to his belt buckle and pauses. The player at third slides away from the back two, maybe three feet closer to him, to home, uh, to home and a score. Russ stares at him. The player stares back. It's a dangerous game of cat and mouse. <laughs> oh no, don't do it, screams my brain. If Russ twitches even a little towards the runner, but doesn't throw to Vince at third to get the man out, that's a balk. A balk is a walk. A walk ties the game. Russ ain't taking the bait. He turns his head slowly towards home plate. His fluid leg raises to his right hip, twisting like his torso like a spring. His right arm stretches back, his right hand clutching the ball, fingernails piercing the twin red seams. He thrusts forward in a hot rush and sings a fastball big and fat, right down the center, waist high, crack! A scalding sonic boom, lying drive, to my left, high over my head, so fast I cannot see it. I jump to its heel, to where I think it should be, to where I want it to be, reaching my glove as far, whack! I catch it. I come down fast, but I open my glove slow. The ball trapped in the pocket of my tan shoeless gel mitt is hot and smoking. 
I can almost hear air molecules boiling off its surface. <laughs> I can't take my eyes off it. I just stand there, stupefied. Not for long. I hear the runner on second making a beeline for third. His cleats rip through the infield, popping the rough sand like Rice Krispies and milk. <laughs> I twist my ear and jerk my head. I couldn't see the ball, but I, I see him. I pivot fast on my heel, bending to my left, spinning like a clock going backward. I lash my arm sideways, snap my glove, and tag the flapping pockets of his fleeing butt. <laughs> Out! The young cries. <laughs> time he stops. I'm thunderstruck. Struck. <laughs> I'm thunderstruck. <laughs> two outs in two seconds. I stand there, dazed, again, seared in place. It just happened. I made a double play. My teammates yell my name. Phil! Phil! Huh? What? I turn my molasses head. I blink lazily at their blurry bodies jumping up and down and waving like palm trees in a mirage, but pointing. Phil third! I blink. Phil third! I shake my head. Phil third! <laughs> they are on fire. The Davy at second and Toby at first are waving their hands, yelling and screaming at me. Russ stands on the mound, pointing with outstretched arms, his eyes beseeching me to see the action at home plate. When I finally do, I see Bill Sandusky huffing and puffing back to third from home. Then it hits me. He didn't tag up. Like us all, Bill thought the line drive rocketing off Biff's bat would burn a hole over the outfield, bounce in the parking lot, and smash a bunch of windshields. <laughs> He took off running. All three runners did, which is why, with sheer dumb luck, I made a great catch, gliding on a smooth pivot and smacking my glove like a fly swatter, making two outs in two seconds. Now here comes Bill. I know, I should be a good sport, and throw the ball to Vince at third, making Bill out number three. Game over, but I, but I don't. <laughs> I hate Bill Zadusky. <laughs> I hate him a lot. He's a bully. He towers over us. Pushes small kids like me around, calls us names like shrimp and small fry and dwarf. I hate this gap tooth grin, poop on fire, breath, fat belly. <laughs> Watching him bounce his flabby gut up to third base line makes me smile. <laughs> his red cap falls to the track behind him. Sweat pours down his face, chest, and arms. I gaze at third base, and then at him. I give him a wink. He glares. But it's useless. Bill and I both know he can't get to third before I can. Throw me out, twerp, he yells. Throw me out, I'm dying here, he begs. I stare at him, our eyeballs on each other like snipers. Your mother wears combat boots, he taunts. That does it. No mercy. No mercy at all. Still smiling, but never taking my eyes off him. I stroll over to Vince on third base and plop the ball into his face up, yearning in love. Drop it. Don't drop it, I say, calmly off the field. A triple play! Oh my god, a triple play all by myself. I can hardly grab a breath. Yet I run around in the grass, dancing a boogie woogie. <laughs> From the field, the players break into a dead heat. From the dugout, the team explodes off the bench. All the guys and the coaches rush higgly piggly, yelling and screaming, slapping me on the back, pushing, shoving, and lifting me up on their shoulders, shouting, hooray! I break up laughing and can't stop. It's one moment, these 20 silver seconds hoisted in the air. The clouds open up, and the sun gleams down on my great big brain. And it feels so good. I'm a hero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. That was wonderful. Yeah. Um, and now we are going to have 20 questions with the two authors of the stories you just heard, Frank Joya and Philip Jacques. So I would like to invite first um, Joshua Lasky, who is our artistic director. He's going to be doing the questioning. And then um, if Frank and Philip would like to come up as well, we will be one big happy family of you. Okay, so this is inside the writer's studio which is a game of 20 questions inspired by the Bernard Pivot inspired end of James Lipton's Inside the Actors Studio. I'm an academic, I have to cite my sources. <laughs> okay, there are four simple rules. First one is, I can't see because they'll bear with it. Speak before you think. <laughs> I've done that too many times. <laughs> Brevity is the soul of wit. 
There are no wrong answers. And enjoy yourself. Yeah, okay. Do you have any questions? No. no. <laughs> are you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Philip, you got the first question. Right. You're holding the microphone. When, where, and or how did you first fall in love with writing? I first fell in love uh, with writing when I was courting my girlfriend, Daryl, over there. And uh, she noticed that in my text, I, I seemed to have a flair with words. And uh, we got into a writing group with Joan, and uh, that's how I fell in love with writing. Aww. All right, same question. I would say, uh, for me, it happened about 30 years ago. Um, at a gathering of friends who decided one of the nicer ways to spend a winter evening was for us to read to each other. Uh, and so I wrote a story uh, about an Italian Christmas Eve, uh, and it was very nicely received, and I just continued writing. Great. Okay, so Frank, you're gonna go first on the second one. Okay. <laughs> What's the worst thing you've ever spilled while writing? <laughs> I think um, I have a story in my book called Powder Blue Pants. Oh no. And uh, when I was 12 or 13 years old, I spilled ink on those pants in grammar school. Uh, I don't divulge that in the story, but I'll tell you that tonight. I was going to say, because I had read this book and I didn't know that. <laughs> so. All right, Philip, same thing. Worst thing you've ever spelled while writing? My guts. <laughs> okay, so then who was your favorite character when you were 10? Uh, it would have had to have been Batman. Yeah. I would say it was either uh, a character known as G.I. Joe uh, or the Brooklyn Dodger center fielder, uh, Duke Snyder. Perfect. So who's your favorite character now? I'm really enthralled with uh, Susie Kaufman. Uh, a woman I've been married to for 40 some odd years, uh, who's a hell of a lot better writer than I am. Aww. So I guess the favorite character now is, so I'm writing a memoir, or I'm trying to write a memoir, and the story that we just, uh, we just read so well, by the way, uh, is my 12 year old self, and I'm kind of finding out things about her mom life. Great. Okay, so now, what's the best piece of writing advice you've ever gotten? Uh, two. Uh, Joan, Collin, uh, Joan Griffin is also one of my mentors out there, and it was, uh, uh, tell it like it is and don't give up. Nice. Just write. Yeah. Put the words down on the page and then worry about the editing. Yes. Whatever comes into your mind, put it down. I'm inviting Frank to, t to talk to my undergraduate writers. <laughs> <laughs> writing is editing. Writing is editing. Yeah. How many times do you have to say that to, to young people? Um, so what's the worst piece of writing advice you've ever gotten? You don't have to say who said it. If they're in the room, just... Maybe rephrase it. The worst piece of uh, advice I've ever gotten about writing, it doesn't really matter what you put down um, as long as you put it down. <laughs> so wait, wait, that's the same advice that's also the best advice. Did I, did I miss something there? That's some mind-bending uh, 
I'm sticking with that. I, I think it's a fantastic answer, personally. I just, I mean, I'd probably wake up at three in the morning going, I get it. Okay, so Philip, what's the worst? You call that writing? Oh. <laughs> Was that on a piece of paper or a text message, or did you write that on your own hand or in a text? Probably my own hand. <laughs> okay, so what's one word you'll never put in print? You have to remember James Lipton asked people to curse on television, so. Yeah, but it was <laughs> All right, so I can't actually tell you the one word I would never put in print because it's highly derogatory. Okay, that's, right. that's, so it, yeah. that's fair, that's fair. I like to think I can put anything uh, in print and uh, for the most part I do. Uh, but there is a C word uh, referring to women uh, that I refuse to say and I refuse to use in print. So that is the one that I was dreaming oh, of. <laughs> so you can describe the word without using the word. We're all writers here, right? We can describe around the words. Okay, so what pen names have you toyed with? Whoever has the microphone. Pen names. pen names. What pen names have you toyed with? I haven't. That's an answer. It's not a sort of true answer, but it's an answer. I use the word Damien Frank. Oh. You've really never no pen names ever? I, I'm new at this. I <laughs> give it time. No, yeah, really, give me time. Okay, okay. When I write something so bad, then I'll put down a pen. <laughs> So, what's your, where's your favorite place to write? Actually, it's, it would be at my desk. Uh, I have a nice window view of the street, and I just sit there and, and just start writing. I write in bed first thing in the morning uh, while I'm drinking coffee. It's virtually the only place I write, and uh, it's... I find it just really uh, enriching. So where's the weirdest place you've ever written? Could be the same answer, actually. I think uh, I have a uh, condominium in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons uh, we bought it there is because it has a swimming pool. And I sit around the pool sometimes and I try to write poetry. And uh, it's always a struggle because it's just so beautiful and you really should just be relaxing and doing nothing. Bill, <laughs> so before you answer, I'd just like to say, Frank, I was hoping you were going to say a water bag. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to imagine, you know, trying to... I know it's always still right by hand. Even, I guess, on a computer, it'd be difficult. Okay, so where does it look? Uh, I, can, I can make you partly happy. Because <laughs> oh, no. it has water in it. <laughs> it was on uh, in my car parked uh, in the street downtown Melbourne during a rainstorm, just a driving rainstorm. And as I was seeing the scene up here, was writing. As soon as I got home, it just flooded out. Flooded. See, <laughs> he says he's new at this. <laughs> okay, so. Philip, you've got the microphone. So who's the first person to see your drafts after yourself, of course? Uh, I, I'm in two critique groups, so I would say actually the first people who see my uh, first draft are these two ladies right here, Dell and uh, Joan. Uh, and then they offer me, as a matter of fact, without them, I, none of these stories would exist. So they're my first go-to. Okay. Cool. Um, my first person is a, a person I mentioned earlier, Susie Kaufman. Uh, she's an essayist and uh, or just a really fine writer. So then, who's the last person you'd ever let see your draft? <laughs> About 10 years ago, I wrote a play and I thought it was finished and I showed it to someone uh, who uh, was a playwright and uh, he showed me that uh, 
there's really a lot more editing uh, in writing than I ever knew. Yeah. Uh, so uh, his name is Larry Zengali, and uh, he's a multifaceted artist. And uh, I guess he would be the guy. Uh, relative to this story, you are the last one to see it, and here I am. <laughs> Good way to learn that one. So, do you have a lost piece of writing you still think about? Actually, I do. It was a, uh, it was a very painful story, and I wrote it. Um, and I became so upset I ripped it up and threw it away. Oh, wow. And I wish I had it back now. Oh. Uh, this is kind of a tough question. Uh, I do have a story um, that is about uh, pedophilia um, and I've never published it, I've never read it. I also have one story in my book uh, that's about a rape. Uh, I've never read it. And um, those are, I guess, two pieces that come to mind. Okay. So what's the best idea you've never used? <laughs> I like to think I have. Oh. What was, what was the question? What's the, what's the best idea you've never used? Um, I, I guess using. Um, I, you know, I don't know how to answer that. I, I really <laughs> don't. I, I try to take as many ideas as possible. There are 20 questions, so if we take over one. So what's that. the worst idea you ever have used? <laughs> uh, I, I wrote a story that was too explicit, and uh, a reviewer uh, who, who thought the, the article was good, but felt that it was bordering on uh, pornographic. So what I did is, as, you, as we were talking about the C word, I found a way to work around it to make it a little easier to digest. Can I get that question again? What's the worst idea you have used? Huh. <laughs> this is the speak before you think. <laughs> This is a very difficult question. Yes, they are. Um, sometimes I question myself about having uh, written the pedophilia story. Um, it sits on my iPad. Uh, very few people know of it. Um, so just having written it, uh, I feel like I've used it and, and divulged uh, some early childhood secrets. Uh, but I will never publish it. So, if you could instantly become an expert in anything, what would you write about? I always wanted to be an industrial archaeologist. I don't know if writing about that would be very interesting, uh, but it seems exciting. Uh, as a vocation. So, if I become an expert in anything, a lot of my memoir was about abuse. So, if I could become an expert to figure out why people abuse other people, that's what I would write about. So, who is the most overhyped writer of all time? <laughs> the guy who wrote Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Mars. <laughs> I'm going to pass. <laughs> okay, so who's the most underappreciated? I 
I have a friend of mine um, who's a former poet laureate uh, in El Dorado County. Her name is Lara Lalart. And I think she's a fabulous poet. And I don't understand why she doesn't sell more books. The most underappreciated writer. Of all time. Of all time. Um, <laughs> not to narrow it down for you at all. Yeah, right. <laughs> The guy who wrote Batman. I don't know. I, I, really don't know. <laughs> I the name just went out of my head. Bill Finger. Bob Kane gets all the credit, right? But Bill Finger doesn't. That's the guy I was thinking of. No. <laughs> anyway, Batman aside. Yeah. <laughs> since you just got me on that track. I'm sorry. No, it's, not, it's a good thing. You and I. Yes. I appreciate Batman like the next person. <laughs> Maybe a little too much. Invited all expenses paid to read your work. Where would you be thrilled to go? And you don't have to stay stories on stage. <laughs> it's okay. It's, this is not a, a self congratulation Stories on stage, Kauai. There you go. <laughs> Send me to Italy anytime. So now, this is the quick bonus round. Who not in this room would you like to thank or otherwise acknowledge? Not in this room. I think that first uh, night when I read my stories uh, with my friends some 30 years ago, uh, there were a couple of guys there that at the time, we're old friends, but um, it didn't hold up uh, over time. Uh, but when I finished, they both, uh, Matt and Mick, uh, gave me a lot of support and just told me to keep writing. So I have. Uh, it would be my older sister. Uh, during our childhood, uh, my oldest sister uh, really became the adult in the room mm -hmm. and took care of the rest of us uh, younger children. Oh. And so now, who in the room? <laughs> we'll finish with who in the room. Oh my goodness. Oh my Call them out. We don't have a spotlight or anything. So we <laughs> Five years ago, I fell in love with this woman over here who encouraged me to fall in love with writing. And the world has opened up so, so very much that that distinction, be it good or bad, would be dope over here. Thank you for watching. I have to confess, um, I enjoy reading my work. Uh, at least as much as I enjoy writing it. And my son is here tonight, my granddaughter, my wife, uh, my son's partner. And uh, I get a real charge out of the fact that those four people uh, come, come to a lot of my readings. And so I just want to thank them for that. So we are, I'll do the interview announcement. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So now to the intermission, which I'm usually the one who flicks the lights on. So just trust me that it's intermission. We'll get the lights on in a second. Um, there are books being sold at the back. There are stories on stage, books and things being sold at the back. There are cookies that need to be eaten at the back. <laughs> The bathrooms are at the back, and then you'll come back, and we'll do something else. And now again, we'll let everybody get seated. Woo! We're back. We'll let everybody sort of find their seats. Uh, we hope you had a nice intermission, that you hobnobbed, ate cookies, which are almost gone. We're very glad. 
Um, so now, before we uh, bring up the next performer, we're going to do our raffle. Um, so you should have gotten that little yellow ticket when you came in. So make sure you dig that out of wherever it has gone. And we will read. We have three different raffle prizes. Um, they are all books. <coughs> surprise, surprise. Um, the first one, well, actually, not the first one. There are three of them. I have no idea which one is in which bag, so it's going to be a surprise. Um, they are the 2020 anthology from Stories on Stage Sacramento that we put out after 2020. All of the pieces are roughly about 2020, as you might imagine. Um, then we have a copy of Josh Fernandez's book, The Hands That Crafted the Bomb. We are going to hear an excerpt woo, of that um, shortly. Uh, and we have Frank Joya's book, The Mercury, Mercury Man, um, that you heard read from earlier. So without further ado, Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh. Turn up the lights. We can't read it. oh, that's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Anna's doing oh, it for us. Anna's Thank you. It. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We couldn't do it without our volunteers. This is why, see? <laughs> okay, we have 615826. <gasps> Are you serious? Yay! <laughs> okay. Pick a bag, any bag. Um, one, oh, no. one, two, no, or three. Uh, two. No two. Big. Middle one. Okay. Got it. There you go. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. What'd you get? Oh, she got Josh's book. Excellent. Okay. Next. Everybody's stuck together. Okay. Okay. Uh, 615849. Oh, 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 oh. Bag one or two. Yay! We'll bring it to you. It's yeah, okay. I'll, I'll come. One or two. Okay. And last one. We'll keep it a surprise. We won't know which one this is. It is. 615882. 882. Going once. Going twice. All right, we are moving on to 615838. I had the right there. <laughs> All right, thank you all. Um, now, do you want to hit the lights? Yeah. All right, so just a little information again right before we get started. Uh, the excerpt that you are about to hear is from Josh Fernandez's new memoir, Hot Off the Press. The Hands That Crafted the Bomb, um, yeah. which is also for sale in the back of the room. So if you didn't win it, then you can go buy it. Um, and it will be read by Elio Gutierrez Montoya. And then following that, we will have another round of 20 questions with Josh Fernandez this time. And just uh, before we let you guys go, sort of by the end of the evening, we want you to be thinking that our next event is in May which yes, there's a big gap, but we're only doing four this season, so our next event is May 10th. It's the second Friday of May, I'm pretty sure it's May 10th. Um, and the theme is Imagine a World, Tales to Make You Think. So that is what is next in May. I'll be back up here afterwards, but for now, here's Elio. Good evening. I think worth mentioning again. The following excerpts come from The Hands That Crafted the Bomb, The Making of a Lifelong Anti-Fascist by Josh Fernandez, a memoir. To understand how I ended up here, a middle-aged man about to get fired from his job for starting an anti-fascist club with his students, we have to go back to the first thing I remember, which is my sister. Her name was Sunshine. Seriously. <laughs> we didn't know it then, but my dad was in the early stages of psychosis and named her Sunshine before he lost his mind and left my family in Sacramento. He wanted to name me Bear, but my mom drew the line and named me something normal. Maybe so I wouldn't get teased, but more likely so she wouldn't get teased. <coughs> she wanted everything to be regular and didn't want to draw any extra attention to herself. She went with Joshua. It's almost like she found the name on a discount rack at Sears. Uh, cheap enough, not offensive to anybody. It's fine. We'll take it. 
The name Sunshine fit my sister. She was happy and energetic, and people basked in her presence. I could see the entire world reflected in her big, bright eyes. My eyes were matte black, like an unfinished automobile, glossless and utilitarian. She was eight. I was five. She was happy. I wasn't. While our parents worked, a woman named Eva babysat us. She spoke mostly in Spanish. Uh, she sat us in front of the TV and turned on PBS, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Bob Ross, and the nature shows where insects ripped the heads off from, from each other or other insects. <laughs> Everything was interesting to my sister. The sky, the street, my mom's face, the little bees that buzzed through the flower patch, all of it. <clears throat> I was so bored with everything that I decided to watch TV sitting on my head while Eva sat on the couch right side up. <laughs> I know Sesame Street was supposed to be fascinating to children with the little colorful monsters and the brown guy with the guitar, but I didn't care for the spectacle. It was just something to do while I was upside down my, in my brown velour shirt with yellow stripes bunched over my chin, belly button out like a third eye. I practiced sitting on my head for extended periods. I got good at it too. So good that I eventually preferred living that way, everything upside down. I could sit forever with my head and back resting against the wall, blood rushing from my toes to my brain, while upside down polar bears fucked on the upside down tundra. <laughs> Sometimes I'd fall asleep then wake up still upside down. Other times I'd fall asleep, toppled over mid-dream, and wake up with my face smashed against the wall. <laughs> if that happened, I'd slide my head against the wall, invert my body again, and continue watching TV. I imagined that my upside-downness was a nuisance to everyone, that they gathered in rooms together to speak in hushed tones about my upside-down problem. Did you see him today? That boy, his face was blood red like some kind of demon. But I don't think anyone noticed or cared. Bye, Sunshine said, her bright eyes beaming towards the sidewalk where our neighbors skidded around the block on, big, on the big wheels. They'd call my name and I'd pretend not to hear. They couldn't compete with Upside Down Oscar the Grouch, Upside Down Mr. Rogers, the Upside Down Man painting happy Upside Down clouds, <laughs> Upside Down cannibalistic insects, the, and, and naked Upside Down Islanders swinging their Upside Down tits in ritual. <laughs> I'd rather stay indoors. Sunshine had more friends than I. Friends seemed too hard to manage. They always wanted to take my things or play with my toys. <laughs> I didn't know how I was supposed to act around them. One time, I went to a birthday party where a little boy unwrapped his Star Wars X-Wing starfighter and set it aside to unwrap more presents. I, I, played with, I played with it while they ate cake, and then I tried to adjust its wing and it snapped. I placed the pieces back together, hastily left the party, and never talked to any of them again. Oh, no. <laughs> they never spoke to me either, an unwritten contract to which we all agreed. Sunshine played and played and played, and everyone loved her. Sunshine, they'd say, or, oh, you are Sunshine. I felt like a little tombstone an inverted tombstone with etchings too worn to read. <laughs> Nobody bent down, pinched my cheeks, and said, Oh, look at how Josh he is. He is so Josh-like. <laughs> when I wasn't upside down, I wanted to be upside down. In the grocery store, I'd tilt my head around and down until I could finally read the flipped over packages. Fruit Loops and Morton Salt and canned peaches all looked more delicious in my overturned world. I pretended that I couldn't do anything until I was upside down. My mom showed me a cereal box and I, started, I stared straight ahead like I was in a coma, unable to communicate in the right side of world. 
and my mom's eyebrows raised. She was so beautiful in her long dress with flowers of every color moving in the fabric. I wonder now if my mother hated me for being an upside down boy. If she wanted a regular boy who wanted to be right side up, if she did, she didn't show it. At night, she sat on the edge of the bed, ran her soft fingers against my back, feelings, she called them, and read fables of the origins of things, like how the zebra got his stripes, and how elephants got their tusks, until my eyelids heavied and I fell asleep, lying horizontally, like a regular boy. I wish she had told me the story of when she met my father. It was at a march against the Los Angeles uh, police after they killed the Chicano journalist Ruben Salazar with a tear gas projected. Hundreds of brown people flooded the streets shouting with rage so furious that they all fell in love with each other even if they weren't meant to be. <laughs> but she never told that story. I only heard it secondhand. She only told normal stories the ones that couldn't hurt me. It was night. A sliver of moon peeked through the blinds. I sprawled across my mom's legs on the couch while she ran her fingers across my back. I love you, she said. I couldn't say anything back. I, I didn't know what to say. Love embarrassed me. The thought of it turned my cheeks red. Matte black absorbs, but doesn't reflect. Sunshine is my sister who shares my blood, but it is so different than, but is so different than me. She is the light and I am the dark. That's what I thought. <laughs> but we share the blood of our mother. We share the blood of our father. She is strong when she needs to be. She can appear normal sometimes. Like me, she is an anti-authoritarian. She is a rebel. She is flawed. She is broken. She is whole. She is my mother. She is my father. None of us are normal. We are so fucked up in so many ways that it forms a sort of beauty. Like an alleyway in the corner of the city filled with graffiti and trash the colors are an abstract painting, so gross that you can't help but to notice its magnificence. Robert Villalobos Fernandez. My dad walked through the kitchen, chest out, ponytail swinging from side to side, holding a glass of lemonade, ice cubes clinking with each step. Hey, man, he said like a Mexican surfer, <laughs> slow and drawn out, adding a few extra vowels so it sounded like man. Uh, we're going to the flea market, he said. Get your sister. I jumped up and I scrambled to find Sunshine, who was in her room making ballerina poses in front of a mirror. Come on, I said, annoyed. Fine, she suggested. She uh, shrugged, finishing a half-ass grand plié. I loved when our dad took us places. The store, the park, anywhere. We drove to the market through our neighborhood in Sacramento. The park with playgrounds every few blocks and lush trees hanging over the sidewalks and pulled into a lot full of cars. My dad tapped out the drums to Earth, Wind & Fire's Let's Groove and on a steering wheel until we pulled into the flea market parking lot full of beat up cars, just like ours. We wandered around the market looking at the toys, the colorful dresses on sale, on sales rides, the wobbly tables full of old memorabilia. Old men sitting in chairs eyed us carefully so we wouldn't slip something into our pockets. Dad skipped over a booth and came back with a maniacal grin and a bag of weird persimmon candy coated in coconut. <laughs> he looked like a little kid with his bag of orange candy. 
Sunshine and I glanced at each other with exaggerated frowns. It looked so disgusting that I didn't want any of it, and neither did Sunshine. Time to go, our dad said, and we skipped back to the car. He buckled us in and opened his bag of candy, pulling out an orange glob covered in white flakes. He held one of the pieces up to the light and smiled. You sure? He asked. My sister and I held our noses. <laughs> You're lost, he said, and stuffed one of the nuggets into his mouth. He chewed, then started the car, setting the bag on the floor. Before he could pull out of the parking lot, a weird look contorted his face that began to redden and then completely flush. His eyes scrunched up and his mouth puckered and under his beard. Oh shit. And then he heaved, hurled a massive stream of vomit that spewed onto the steering wheel, the dashboard, everywhere. Fuck, he screamed, shit! He balled his fist and punched the steering wheel until his hand slipped on the barf and hit the dashboard, slicing his knuckle right, uh, wide open. He beat the steering wheel again and again, the blood mixing with vomit, and I gagged in disgust. My sister found a shirt in the back seat and gave it to my father, who clumsily soaked up all of the barf while sulking in the front seat. We rolled the windows down for the ride home, but it was still rancid in the car. My dad muttered curse words all the way back, and when we got home, he slammed the car door and stormed into the house. I looked at Sunshine for a bit of light, but she looked just as sullen as I did. That incredible joy of our father that turned into violent anger like an unseen hand flipping a switch in his brain. More often, I would, I would catch him with a faraway glazed look, the muscles of his face too relaxed to be human, as if he was wearing a cheaply made mask of himself. I, I didn't really know what was happening with my dad, but I knew that I didn't want to be like him. He was too weird, too mad too scary. My parents began arguing all the time. My dad started ranting about God. I'd only heard about God from friends. A kid in my class had parents who listened to heavy metal. Uh, they blasted Dio's uh, Heaven and Hell. And I'd never heard anything so amazing, the loud, crunchy guitars and Ronnie James Dio screaming about the devil. <laughs> One day, I asked dad about the devil while driving to the grocery store. Don't talk about the devil. I asked him if I could have a new name. You already have a name, he said, but my name is stupid. Your mom says it's strong. I'm not strong. Your name is in the Bible, you know. The devil is in the Bible, I said. <laughs> Fucking hell, he cried, slamming his feet on the brakes. His shit orange station wagon skidded into a bush, and it took all my strength not to laugh. Something changed in his eyes. A glow, scary energy, like an electric current that ran through his body and shot out through his eyes. He scowled around the house with what, what, what looked, what, uh, he scowled around the house with that look until he finally split for good. He pulled up all the marijuana plants in the backyard and took off, and my mother wouldn't tell me where. All I know is that he went crazy. His last day, he looked at me the way that someone looks at their glass when they're expecting water but they get milk. <laughs> he didn't say a word. I mouthed the word, devil, under my breath to see what he would do. He pretended not to hear. Maybe that's why he went crazy. No son of his would mention the devil's name. No son of his would pervert his Bible. 
The Old Testament, the New Testament, the hand cutting, the slave checking, the sin, the penance, all of it. It was all real for him, realer than anything. Realer than his family, realer than, realer than the Chicanos, the, his people, our people, who he used to believe in and march for in the, in the streets. In a sense, I admired his compulsion to desire something, in his case, a higher power, and more specifically, God, so unconditionally that it would tear the heart from your own child. He took off to Samoa, where he was going to practice law. He had no law degree or job prospects, so it wasn't exactly a solid plan. <laughs> but he did it anyway. Another trait he passed on to me, the great Fernandez clan, known for poverty and fist fights in the street. We run face first into trouble, if only to make a grand, dramatic statement to the world. with, um, again, I'd like to call Josh Velasky back up, our artistic director, and invite Josh Fernandez to the stage. All right, so feel free to go out to the audience. You don't have to look at me. I'm going to look right into your eyes. That's what I'm like. You have to remember, I'm a professional performer. I'll look right back at you and you uh, Okay. And I'm a coward, so I'll just run away. Oh, no. <laughs> so remember, four simple rules. Speak before you think. Yep. Gravity is the soul of wit. Okay. There are no wrong answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By my standards. Okay. Enjoy yourself. Okay. Do you have any questions? No, I don't. How are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay, when, where, and or how did you first fall in love with writing? Uh, I started writing little comic books when I was in second I plagiarized Marvel comics when I was in second grade. <laughs> My mom laughed at them. She wasn't supposed to laugh. Uh, and I got really mad at her, but I kept doing it anyway. So, nice. so what's the worst thing you've ever spilled while writing? Uh, I, I actually spilled water on my laptop and it exploded into a bowl of flames. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this is why is that funny? <laughs> it was because not funny at the time. I'm sure it wasn't, but the vision in my mind what happened was I too have destroyed a laptop, not quite like that, but I have burned one out. Um, but you got a ball of flame, I didn't get a ball of flame. So, who was your favorite character when you were 10? I think Darth Vader. Who's your favorite character now? Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best piece of writing advice you've ever gotten? Quit. <laughs> What's the worst? That was also the worst. <laughs> What's one word you'll never put in print? God. Wasn't that just in the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave that. Um, that was the first thing I thought of. It was, I was I you, 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 you were following the rules. Rule. Laid out. You, are, you were playing the game correctly. I just <laughs> went wrong. I was like, wait a minute. Because I read the excerpt, obviously, before, um, because I picked it for tonight, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, but I also, Elio just said, you're bending my mind. Yes. So, what pen names have you toyed with? I don't have any pen names, but my Discord name is Corpse Thrower. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> this is a follow-up question that is not on my list. Do you think you'd sell more books if you put Corpse Thrower on IPM? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, what's your favorite place to write? Or where is your favorite place to write? Um, it's the only place, it's just my desk, my, my little desk with a bunch of shit all over it. Alright, <laughs> what's the weirdest place you've ever written? Oh, 
I'm, I don't know why I'm surprised by these questions. <laughs> not like, wow, what an original, <laughs> beautiful question that was. Uh, the, the weirdest? Is that the weirdest, the weirdest place you've ever lived in? Uh, I don't know. Probably while I'm supposed to be teaching my class and I give my students some shit to do and I'm like, I'm just going to write my novel right now. <laughs> <laughs> This is being recorded, and I just want to make sure that it doesn't go. Um, because I know you, I mean, the whole book is about you almost lost your job once. And, right. But the thing you were accused of then compared to this would be. And I'm tenured now. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Well, then. I mean, tenure. Now let's get to the real question. Congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. So, who's the first person to see your drafts after yourself? Honestly, I think it was my students in prison because I knew they weren't going to blab about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, where are they going to take that shit? <laughs> Who's the last person you'd let see your drafts? Probably the administrators at my school. <laughs> so yeah, buy the book and read the rest of the story. Um, <clears throat> do you have a lost piece of writing you still think about? Yeah, I do. Anyone share? No. <laughs> What's the best idea you've ever used? Um, I, I don't want to tell you because you're going to steal it. That is literally the hardest question on this whole thing. I know some of the other ones feel the way, but for a writer, that's the one I'm actually interested in if they'll answer. Yeah. Um, and no is a valid, valid answer. What's the worst idea you have ever used? Probably writing this book about a job that I'm still working at. <laughs> If you could instantly become an expert in anything, what would you write about? Oh, probably some math bullshit. <laughs> you would become an expert and then write about the math bullshit, or you'd want to just become an expert in the math bullshit? I would become an, well, no, that's hard. I would just write about, I would just automatically become an expert about math. I don't want to study math. <laughs> that's, that, this is instant. This is just this is Marvel comic magic. Just you become math man. Yeah, um, and or then Cap I, Captain Math or whatever Marvel. I don't know. The difference. Yeah, and then I'd write about it. Yeah, like a textbook or no, 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 like a mathematical fiction or something like that. Nice new genre. Yeah, you're tenured. You, you you probably get you can go to classes right for yeah, free. Maybe go drop into a math class. I'm just doing research. So. Who's the most overhyped writer of all time? Oh, man. Uh, Harry Potter lady. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even utter her name. Because you can't remember it? Or because you don't say her name like in her books, the one who shall not be named? I can't remember her name. <laughs> that's, that's fine. I won't utter it for you. Who is the most underappreciated writer of all time? Maybe Asata Shakur. Yeah. Okay, that name can write good, okay? Yeah. So, invited all expenses paid to read your work, where would you be thrilled to go? Um, somewhere hot, just wherever is hot. I don't like cold, so just somewhere just towards the, the hottest equator. place on Earth. Right now. <laughs> okay. The sun. I'd like to go to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. If you had to pay your own way, where would you go? If I had to pay my own way, yeah. where would you be thrilled to go? Lodi, California. <laughs> <laughs> so, who not in this room would you like to thank or otherwise acknowledge? Not in this room? Not in this room. God. <laughs> and he was nervous about getting up here. Anybody in the room you would like to thank or not to acknowledge? Well, my wife threatened me before. <laughs> She's like, those two dudes just think they're wives. <laughs> so my wife, my kids, beautiful family, just adorable, lovely, would probably be dead without them. So there is a final question that I'm going to ask you um, that I didn't ask the others because you've got to keep something back for the second author, otherwise they'll have written their answers down. 
If the, so the Nobel Prize in Literature currently comes with a monetary award of, quote, 11 million Swedish krona, or about $989,000, unquote, according to the New York Times. If you won the prize, what would you do with the money? I would give it all to my lovely wife. <laughs> <laughs> lovely woman on earth. No one deserves that money more than my wife. <laughs> all right. And that is our program, our official program for tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you, John, for being here. Thank you, everyone. Books are still for sale. Bathrooms are still in the back. I have no idea what the cookie situation is. It's on the wrong side of the room for me. So maybe they're there, maybe they're not. I'd go find out if you want cookies. Thank you for coming. Thank you.